Well, good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to the 35th annual Don B. Catterman Memorial Lecture. I'm Tom Bailey. I'm Dean of the School of Pharmacy, and I'm pleased to see the room so well represented by our alumni, students, and practitioners. Uh, once again, we've combined two of our signature events, uh, the Dean's Recognition Reception and the Don Catterman Memorial Lecture into this one uh, special event uh, to provide an even more impactful opportunity for you to engage with our school. And uh, we got a lot of very positive comments last year, which was the first year we tried this uh, to combine the two events, and so we decided to do it again this year. Um, of course, I look forward to seeing you all at the Dean's Recognition Reception, which will immediately follow this presentation, and it will be in the side gallery, which will be to your left as you exit the theater. Uh, just a word to thank our sponsors, the Pharmacy Alumni Association and the Washington State Pharmacy Association. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the board members of the Pharmacy Alumni Association. And they are Jennifer Glasgow, Jenny Arnold, Suzanne Lee, Adam Brothers, Ryan Oftebro, Michael Ayers, Jeff Rushon, Judy Mar Burbage, Ben Michaels, and Christy Whelan Hamilton. Uh, they've all worked hard to put this and other events together this year, and they've been working, I think, very effectively with our school's advancement team to increase PAA membership and to provide our members with the best resources available. Both the PAA and the School of Pharmacy are committed to providing lifelong learning opportunities that extend beyond the classroom, like this evening's lecture. So now at this time, I'd like to introduce the chair of the Catterman Lecture, Adam Brothers, who will introduce this evening's lecture topic and this evening's speaker. Okay. Thank you very much, Dean Bailey, and thank you all for joining us for this uh, great Pharmacy Alumni Association tradition, the 35th annual Don B. Catterman Memorial Lecture. My name is Adam Brothers, and I'm honored to serve as chair for this year's Catterman Lecture event. This annual lecture is made possible by the Catterman family in honor of the late Don Catterman, who graduated from our school in 1948. As a longtime Seattle pharmacist, a mentor to many UW students, a former UW Pharmacy Alumni Association president, and more, Don Catterman helped make the practice of pharmacy and the instruction of pharmacy students what they are today in our state. It is in his honor that we continue to gather for this event in pursuit of advanced educational opportunities. Our speaker tonight is US Public Health Service Commander Dean T. Gorowski. Commander Gorowski is the Advanced Practice Clinical Pharmacist with Yakima India Health Service in Toppenish, Washington. His responsibilities there include overseeing clinical pharmacy activities such as heart failure clinic and anticoagulation management, working with the Chronic Pain Committee, and management of the local PNT Committee. He also precepts students from Washington State University School of Pharmacy and serves as the public health contact for the University of Montana. He joins us tonight on behalf of Admiral Guyberson and the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps to talk about provider status initiatives nationally and what that means for the practice of pharmacy today and in the future. Commander Gorowski is a pharmacist first and foremost, having received his PharmD from the University of Montana. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Transform Healthcare in 2014, A Call to Action for Pharmacy. It promises to be an informative conversation touching on the 2011 US Public Health Service report advocating provider status for pharmacists current status of these legislative initiatives and foreshadowing the impact that these efforts will have for our patients and profession. Please join me in welcoming Commander Dean Gorowski. First, I want to say how honored I am to actually be selected as a presenter for the 2014 Don Catterman Memorial Lecture. From the information I've found, Don Catterman was not only a pharmacist, but a, a man who was involved, he involved himself and those around him in the profession of pharmacy as a whole. As an instructor, a mentor, and a leader, all the roles in which we strive for those around us to succeed. I'm humbled and honored to be here. And now, you're probably wondering what, who I am and how I got here, and well, let's talk a little bit about it. Rear Admiral Scott Guyberson. Uh, he was probably one of the most influential persons in pharmacy in the last couple years, in my opinion. There are, in the world of pharmacy, there are a few pharmacists who do not, do not know of Rear Admiral Guyberson. And I'm certain I would be in big trouble if I didn't mention first and foremost that he is a pharmacist and he is a provider. He's very proud of this. Some of his other roles include, he's the acting deputy surgeon general of the United States. 
as a pharmacist, as a Bachelor of Pharmacy. He's also the director of the headquarters for our PHS Public Health Service Commission course. And as of May 1st this year, as far as I know, with the retirement of Rear Admiral Thomas McGinnis, I believe he is also the highest ranking active duty pharmacist in the United States. Sarah, are you in crowd back there? All right. Sarah initially invited the Admiral to deliver the Catterman lecture. And she was on student rotations with him through her position in APHA. The rotation happened to be at the same time his pharmacy report to the Surgeon General was released. And he still remembers and appreciates her help during that time. And so I was actually hoping she'd be in here because I wanted to extend a thanks to her also. He wanted me to pass that on to you. Because of government trial restrictions and scheduling, he was unable to accept the invitation to speak. But Sarah was persistent. She asked if there was another officer who could. And so shortly thereafter, I received an email request from Lieutenant Commander Eunice Chung Davies, uh, his right-hand officer. She said the Admiral wanted me to give the Catamaran Memorial Lecture and asked if I'd like to. And inside my mind, I obviously think, well, if he wants me to, do I have a choice? And so I said, yes, I'd be very flattered to. Thank you very much. And so why I'm here, I'm an officer in the United States Pub Public Health Service. I am a pharmacist, and I am a provider. I run the heart failure clinic, uh, among other things, and I oftentimes use pictures to represent some of the training to my patients when I'm describing to them their chronic disease states and the therapies that we're enacting to help them improve or sustain life. And so in an effort to show this in more of a, uh, an easier way to understand, Rear Admiral Guyberson, you ordered the filet mignon, the king of cuts, and it presents very well and it's wonderful. Well, you kind of got something a little bit different, kind of close, but at the same time, at the end of the presentation, I hope that you feel like it's something close to the filet, because uh, I still carry his message and a little bit of my perspective thrown in. So when we have a C lecture, we have to describe our objectives. So straight up on the objective, apply transformative thinking. Big call from Admiral Guyberson. He wants us to change our thought processes. We'll discuss his report to the Surgeon General. We'll facilitate partnerships at the state and national levels to help continue in the momentum and inspire a call to action to help with our own practices, our own thought processes, and building it from the ground up. I do have a disclaimer for you, though, also. My position as an active duty officer with the Public Health Service is apolitical. Not everything that I say will be straight from the book of HHS or the viewpoint of Admiral Guyberson, the Surgeon General, or any of our other health care leaders. It's my own viewpoint, pulls from my experiences and from my translation of Admiral Guyberson's work and experience. And I will report some data and some evidence, and hopefully my passion and enthusiasm will back up some of that data in passing on this message. It takes no great skill to reproduce the consensus. It's, it's not easy to disagree with the consensus. That actually is the harder path. If we want to transform the profession of pharmacy, that's the way we're going to have to think through this, though. So for the next 30 minutes, then, please try to think without some constraint. Get outside of the walls of academia or your current practice without being a health care provider or a pharmacist. Instead, just think of yourself as a community member. Maybe you're interested in health for yourself or for a loved one, interested just for the sake of the nation. And when we talk about transformative thinking, in relation to some of the objectives, I tend to focus on some more specific goals in regards to the profession of pharmacy. We have two students at our facility that just started this week, and one of them has been shadowing me in clinic for the last two days. I was actually just telling Adam a little bit about that. And I always start off with finding out what their professional goals and aspirations are with pharmacy, so I can kind of tailor our experience. Well, I had given a lecture to the Washington State University P1 class three years ago, and this student happened to be sitting in that class, and it was regard to opportunities in federal pharmacy. And he was very excited because this was his first rotation. He was at the Indian Health Service, and he said he wants to practice as a provider. And so I asked him what that meant to him. And he started saying, well, managing and monitoring the medications, adjusting doses, uh, following labs, et cetera. And so I actually cut him off there, and I said, you know, we need to change your thought a little bit because that's still not what we're looking at when we're looking at providers and pharmacists. And so what I tried to tell them is we take care of patients. We take care of their health. We manage their conditions and which medications are their primary but not the only form of treatment. We don't seek to improve their medication possession ratio or time and therapeutic range. We seek better outcomes. 
We give them additional access to quality medical care, preventive and reactive. We help them with access to their primary care providers and help with the quality and focus of those primary care visits because, because well, many of the patient's chronic conditions are already managed and addressed by the time they need to go to that visit. So as I seek to transform his thoughts about the pharmacy profession and our capabilities, I would ask you also to help with this message in your students' minds, in your colleagues' minds, in physicians' minds. Let them know you are not limited to medications. I Seek out resources beyond your university. Unify your message with other groups. Try to make sure that we're models for health. And then let's start looking at some other thoughts and processes of transformative health that have occurred in the last century. Oh, be models for health. Take just a moment to digest some of these. All of these are the results of transformative thinking, not only from the thought and implementation processes, but to the present. Take vaccination, prevention of disease before disease even occurs or takes hold. It's a public health measure now, and we're a big part of it in pharmacy. It makes logical sense that we're involved. We're everywhere. Another example, oh, motor vehicle safety. I remember as a kid, when we would travel on highway trips, we had a 1976 Ford Ranger uh, F-150 with a canopy or a topper on the back. And the best thing was to be a kid and be riding in the back of that in the canopy while we were going down the interstate on trips. We'd stick a sleeping bag in the back and we'd be wrestling, fighting, playing, crying, having fun in the back, not a care in the world, and there wasn't a seat belt within eight feet of us. And it was absurd at that time to think that anyone should be wearing a seat belt or that everyone should be wearing a seat belt. Now, how are we thinking about that? 30 years later, we have airbags, proximity sensors, parking sensors, backup cameras, anti-lock brakes, automatic parking sensors, and it's almost unimaginable for me to try and drive around without having that seat belt strapped across my chest. I almost feel like something wrong is wrong when it's not touching me and my wheels are rolling. So place that in perspective with what we're talking about right now, how you're going to transform pharmacy, how you're going to impress that upon your students, how they are going to transform the healthcare system and pharmacists working in primary care, not even around medication bottles, seeing and managing patient conditions, could be the commonplace 10 or 15 years from now. So all of these, great progression, advancement from the health of the nation to transformation and prevention. So are we there yet? Well, public health from a few years ago, we still have 6.22 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. That places us squarely in 45th place in the world. How about life expectancy, 78, little and change? That still places it 49th, yet we're number one on expenditure. 17.6% of our gross domestic product, $2.5 trillion back in 2009, and we know that that's increasing every single year, and that's over $8,000 per person back in 2009, and still climbing. So let's talk a little bit about the pharmacy report to the Surgeon General. This report has really become the pillar around which we stand and focus on the pharmacist provider status movement. Admiral Guyverson has spent 20 plus years in the public health service in and around pharmacists practicing to the maximal extent of their licenses. He himself has a scope of practice that likely meets or exceeds that of any pharmacist in the nation. The motive of the report though was not pharmacy, it was recognizing the needs of the healthcare system and the capacity of pharmacy services. In his position as the director of the PHS Commission Corps, He's responsible for physicians, dentists, nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, all types of healthcare practitioners. He's responsible for maximizing the benefit of these healthcare assets for the health and welfare of the nation. And he noticed the differences between practice settings for pharmacists in the federal versus the private sectors and how healthcare providers are utilized. In general, physicians, the practice in the private side, same as federal. For nurses, same. Dentists, the same. Pharmacists, very different. Pharmacists were he noticed that pharmacists were not being utilized to their potential in the private sector, but they were being utilized and functioning maximally at the top of their licensure in the federal sector. And that functioning, and that pharmacists had a massive capacity, they were undervalued, and needed to be, this needed to be brought up. 
and need to be backed by the data that would support it and needed to help respond to the national health care needs. This report was a response to the health needs of the nation. And now this report is helping to build momentum and helping hopefully to transform the profession in an effort to meet patients' health needs. So it starts with the basic tenet that we are health care providers, that we deliver patient care. I don't really care what the regulations say, and I won't go outside the law, but I can say that we are health care providers. We work with patients all the time, and almost all the facets of primary care we provide, with the exception of diagnosis. We're public health professionals. We would deal with epidemiologic trends on an everyday basis in our pharmacy and our clinics. We assess patients, we regulate, we educate, we care for public health needs. Everyone knows common law. Common law, not necessarily written in the books, but precedent is set by the same decision over and over again. It may not be written in law, but the result is the same over and over again. For pharmacy, we have a common practice in pharmacy that's out there. We see it over and again. It may not be written in law or regulations, but we take care of patients. And they are not all perfect and stable. We also have a scope that is much broader than what we are allowed to do in some of the laws in some of the states. So our common practice is not quite where common law is yet, but we should leverage that and we should use that as we move forward to meet patient needs. Admiral Guyberson loves this picture. Does anyone know off the top of their head what year this is? Take a guess, someone. Real close, 1963. Wonderful guess. That's the 1963 Volkswagen bus. In 1963, in the Indian Health Service, 51 years ago, that's when we started clinical pharmacy services. And what have we seen for our return on investment? Well, very little. We have a lot more education and certifications, and we have first year residencies and second year residencies and BCPS if we go for that too, but our privileges haven't changed much. So I question our return on investment for that because we go to school just about as much or more than anybody in the healthcare system with the exception of physicians. So think about 50 years and return on investment when you see that picture and think about how much we've been boxed in. As, as a side note, I feel wonderful about the fact that I've been able to protect, practice in this type of a setting for my whole pharmacy practice career. I kind of feel like it's an Alice in Wonderland setting and I'm exploring all the, the wonders and possibilities and every day is kind of a new and exciting thing, just like yesterday, Adam. Uh, I've been able to work in several very different and very clinical settings and I now have a scope of practice that is broader than most pharmacists. And I now think one of my greatest challenges would be not being able to practice like this now that my eyes have been opened to that side of it. And we're moving to change our upcoming pharmacists to see and believe this as an opportunity for practice setting, not just the traditional choices of retail versus hospital pharmacy. So remember that because I'm going to circle back to the Alice in Wonderland side of it. There's our return on investment, round and around. The focus points of the report, first it talks about primary care. And for the most part, it mirrors that of pharmacy practice with the exception of diagnosis. Once you get post-diagnosis, there's almost nothing we cannot do in certain practice environments. We assess patients, patients, we create treatment plans, we treat the patient, we do follow-up care, we do continuity of care, and we are the access point for many patients. And believe me, many times the patients can't gain access to the providers, so they come to me, they call me, they email me, and I have to then, I'll honestly be very strong. They say, why do I need to see my provider? I see you. And I have to tell them, well, I see you for certain things. I've been consulted to take care of your heart failure, your diabetes, your hypertension, your hyperlipidemia. I'm part of a team. I work with your provider. Your provider takes care of the rest. If I step off of that team, I ruin the system. And so I try to keep them in check, although they're looking for the easiest way. And so the definition of primary care per the Institutes of Medicine, all these facets of care we perform with the exception of diagnosis. So once we meet that definition of primary care providers, and let me ask you this, once the provider makes a diagnosis, let's say of type 2 diabetes, what do they do for the next 30 years? Do they re-diagnose at each visit? No, they reassess, and they're still doing primary care. So when we're doing the same facets of care, why aren't we allowed to be recognized as primary care providers also? Full assistant licensure and education. 
We already have collaborative practice agreements in place in the majority of states, but we just aren't maximizing them yet. And the definition varies from state to state. In some states, the CPA means that you can give immunizations. In other states, it means once a diagnosis is made, you can pretty much take care of chronic disease. There's a big difference there. We need to work to clarify and get a more consistent message across the states. And if we can get them all up to speed and maximize the use of pharmacy, we can offer more access to care across the nation. Healthcare provider status is important, but it's also hand in hand with number three. You can't just provide access to care and high levels of care without some way to generate revenue. That's just not a sustainable business model. And listen, we'll take care of anything you want us to, but if we can't get any money for it, and not necessarily money for us, but money for the provider groups we're working for, money for the healthcare system, it's unsustainable. And the bottom line, that revenue should also be commensurate with the level of care provided. Some of the concern that's out there is that once the pharmacy gets this opportunity, every community pharmacy out there is suddenly going to be reimbursed for these visits. Walgreens, Walmart, anything. But the thing being is, it's not going to be. There are, the reimbursement system will likely already be in place, is going to be the one that will be the same as for primary care providers at this time. And it's going to reflect that level of care. And if we provide that level of care, we should be able to generate some revenue for those services. And if the level of care is not there, neither is the reimbursement. And there are already audit systems in place in the medical model. We have soap notes. We document all our diagnosis and procedure codes. And if it's not there, you don't get paid. Excellent. I'm up for showing performance to get paid. It should be that accountability. And we should be held to that same standard as the providers. And evidence-based outcomes. All the report was based on thousands and thousands of evidence-based outcomes because we wanted to get past the habit of needing to prove ourselves. The evidence is already there. We don't need the 489th study telling us that we can take care of anti-coag if you let us. So the report took the stance that yes, our care models are effective, we just need to expand the scope. It had a logical approach to assessing the needs, capacity, and evidence available that represented pharmacists as a viable option to close some of the building gaps in healthcare. Now, let's look at some of the basic tenets of the logical approach, the needs, capacity, and evidence. The three big needs, absolutely, chronic health care, the biggest one in our system. Chronic diseases, just by sheer volume, approximately 135 million people in the United States and 99% of all Medicare spending. And then beyond Medicare, total spending on chronic conditions in the nation accounts for 84% of all the health care dollars. People with chronic conditions count for 81% of all hospital admissions. So where's the workload coming from? Not just your motor vehicle accidents, falls, and injuries. That's 19%. The rest is chronic. And now the numbers get even bigger. People with chronic conditions amount, account for 91% of all prescriptions filled in the United States. So how important is that to pharmacy? That's how we treat people once they're diagnosed. And the needs of chronic care are not only in the elderly. They're across the generations. It's kids, it's young adults, it's the middle-aged, the young elderly, and the old. We're diagnosing patients younger than ever before with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. We have more and better tools to treat them with, so they're living, and they're living longer. And so that is just incre increasing the continuum of care on both ends of the spectrum. And someone is going to have to take care of those patients for a long time after diagnosis. So it's not the diagnostics, not the acute care, not the reactive. It's the chronic care across the lifetime. The health, the health care system cannot sustain that level of care for that long a time. We need to start thinking ahead for solutions. Other needs. Accessibility. Who does the patient have access to? Accessibility is a huge issue right now because although we have a very robust and developed healthcare system, we're working to give eligibility to everybody to have insurance. That doesn't necessarily mean or give everybody access to care. Over 56 million people right now are estimated to lack access to primary care. That number is increasing. It's expected to be 80 million in the next five years. So who's going to see these patients? What's their pathway to a health care provider? We should be a partial solution for that roadmap, especially for chronic care. So the final piece to wrap up the three big challenges, who will provide care for the chronic disease patients? Our physicians are already overburdened. 
nothing to do with their capability or capacity. They're working hard, they're smart, but their panel sizes are increasing and they're expected to see more complex patients in shorter visits. They're expected and required to have more extensive documentation and they just can't see everybody. And the nurse practitioners and PAs are also at capacity. And where are they located? There may be an adequate supply of providers in Seattle, Tacoma, Spokane, but Washington is much bigger than that. And so are most other states. And most states have decidedly rural areas that may not have enough of those providers. And who are a lot of the providers, who are a lot of the patients now becoming eligible for health insurance? The medically underserved, vulnerable populations, Medicaid patients. And physicians already have issue with payment systems. Maybe they aren't getting paid enough. Some family physicians are probably getting paid less than some pharmacy physicians out there. And for all that li liability, is that right? It might give a little more appreciation as to why some of the phys physicians are choosing to specialize. So where is that primary, work care, that primary care workforce going to come from? Now let's look a little bit at our capacity and I'm gonna pick on pharmacy a little bit too. If you look to the left, you see post-diagnosis. And this is what we do as pharmacists. These activities are right in my collaborative practice agreement and then CPAs in different organizations and states across the nation. We all do these things we have for decades. When you ask a physician what this diagram represents, if they had to classify it as a visit, what would they say? It's a chronic care visit, also known as an established care visit. But what do we in pharmacy call it? Do we have any guesses for what we like to describe that as a pharmacist? What's that? There you go are wonderful, wonderful pharmacist acronyms. So when I ask you to transform your thought on pharmacy practice and capability, I'm going to ask you to not use these. This is not our overall package. That's tying us right back to the medications. These are all supported strongly by someone in pharmacy, but it's not the whole picture. This is the whole picture. This is what we do. Once the diagnosis is made, we can prevent disease and improve disease outcomes. We can take care of people. The acronyms are just a little piece of what we do and every provider does it and it's the lowest common denominator for us. It can be done by any healthcare professional. It can be done by nurses, pharmacy technicians, it can be done by primary care providers. And it can be done in any community pharmacy or retail pharmacy. And that's wonderful because that is our power, our access to the community. So if we focus just on the medication services, aren't we selling ourselves short with our capabilities and our access? Shouldn't we work to expand the scope of practice and really add some value to that access and to the healthcare system? Given the future of healthcare system and chronic disease, do we really want to pin ourselves just to the medications? Now look at the capacity of pharmacists. And this is very pharmacy specific. Chronic diseases and chronic care demands. We basically have more training than any other healthcare professional, as good or as good any other except for physicians. PAs, NPs, dentists even, we're right there with our educational training level. What do we get trained on? Well, we sure don't memorize drug-drug interactions or drug names for six years. We learn about therapy, we learn about diagnosis, we learn about differential diagnosis. We know how the provider's thought processes are working. We learn about mechanism of action. We learn how to talk to people and communicate. And the training focuses on chronic care. So the training is there, let's get past that. Treatment. Treatment is roughly 80% with medications. And as I mentioned earlier, the patients with chronic diseases are 91% of our prescriptions. Yes, there are other options, naturopathy, physical therapy, holistic medicine, others, but for the most part, our country, our healthcare system, uses medications to treat chronic diseases. And again, evidence, I'm just gonna fly by that because evidence I've stated a couple of times, it's there thousands of articles, 30 plus years, and we don't need to prove ourselves anymore. So 270 million people. If I were to tell you that 270 million people have access to or go into a pharmacy every so often, what would you say? Every month, every two months, every four months? One month? One week. One week, 270 million people go through the doors of a pharmacy and have access to their pharmacist. And as current trends continue with the supply of pharmacists on the rise, 
and even possibly meeting or exceeding demand, we will have a well-educated, accessible, and available supply of healthcare providers to help and augment the need for access to chronic disease care. More on capacity. We are the key to cost containment. We're always at P&T. We're always managing the budget. We're looking for options for the patients. We're staring at them. We're talking to them. We see how it impacts them at the end of the day. And cost containment will continue to be a big issue. I can't comment too much on it, but given that people are being diagnosed earlier, living longer, we're already beyond what we can pay for. And it, I can't really comment on how the healthcare system is going to be evolving, but it's easy enough to say that costs and needs will continue to rise, and we need to start planning ahead and have some solutions, because we don't have the solutions right now. Four to one is our return on investment. You, you give us one dollar, eventually as a pharmacist and our services, we'll give you four dollars at the end of it. And that's across two to three decades of evidence-based cost efficacy studies. And that's, e that's just the average. Sometimes it takes a little longer to reach that money, sometimes earlier. Sometimes the return on investment is even higher, 12 to 1, 15 to 1, but it's always on the positive side. And finally, after the needs and the capacity, one more time, the evidence, just to hammer it home. We do not need any more studies saying, hey, I can take care of your patient. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> in summary, then, we like to put this down in what we call our elevator speech. So with all the needs, capacity, and data, data here we go. Chronic disease is the greatest health care burden in the United States, and we take care of it primarily with medication therapy. Pharmacists are the second most educated provider next to physicians with specialized training in post-diagnosis treatment of chronic conditions, conditions through medications. We're located practically everywhere in the healthcare system. We've shown that our healthcare strategies provide cost containment and positive outcomes across the decades, and it's supported by informed physicians. There's rarely any evidence to the contrary, and you tell me that we're not underutilized. That took about 30 seconds and could be done in an elevator. Ding. <laughs> Over the past two to three years, the momentum of the road for the, towards provider status, status has really come to a tipping point and has been spreading virally like a social epidemic. There are three laws to a social epidemic. The law of the few, also co called the 80-20 principle, which is the idea that in any situation, roughly 80% of the work is going to be done by 20% of the participants. Is Don Downing here? I'd, I'd like to say Don Downing deserves a great amount of thanks and credit from the pharmacy profession in Washington, because he is one of those few that is making the connections He's offering subject matter expertise, and he's selling the idea of our capability wholesale, all over the place. And you are there, Don. Thank you. The next, the next thing then, with that social epidemic and with this change coming on, we need the stickiness factor. We need a unified message that's going on to help make it memorable. We take care of patients. We are providers. Let it stick and don't think about the medications. Power of context. Human behavior is sensitive to and strongly influenced by the environment. We focus on the needs capacity and the data and leverage that to help us and build an, a better environment for health and people will flock to it. So we're at the threshold but are we there yet? Well we're pretty close. 66 percent of voters nationwide said they think pharmacists are healthcare providers. 80% of the Beltway leaders, so Congress, lobbyists, the political machine, feel that we're part of the patient's overall healthcare team. The most significant barrier is the discomfort that many physicians feel about giving up decisions regarding preventive and chronic care, which, though seemingly routine, are often complicated by patients' various coexisting conditions, preferences, and goals. So how do we need to approach this transformation? Well, we need to help to define some of the desires of that relationship. We sure don't want it to look or feel anything like this. <laughs> we don't want the providers having to feel like they're being choked down with us coming and taking over their services. Do we want to be the birds pecking around trying to get one more nut saying, hey, I can do this, hey, I can do this, give me this. Well, sometimes we do. I know I do sometimes, and I, I, I try to hold back on that. Maybe it's a little bit more like this. Providers kind of going about their business. We're kind of there 
picking away at things. There's a little bit of a, a work together. We get things done. I, I don't think that's still the goal that we want, though. I think when we're looking for the relationship that we're trying to sell to our providers and to the healthcare system is this relationship, the sea anemone and the clownfish, a perfect symbiotic relation. They give, they give, they give. No one loses out in it. That's what we want our providers to feel. That's what we need to work for. So let's be cautious about it and not try to precipitate a turf issue any further. There's always going to be turf issues. Pharmacists are stubborn. Physicians and nurses are stubborn. And 20% 20 20 of the minds we're never going to change. 20% may already have, but it's those 60% that we really need to use our tact and our diplomacy in trying to bring them over to our, our thought processes. That's an extra slide. So when we look back again to the Indian Health Service model, and I tend to do this because this is where I have thrived for all of my career, we actually did study how did it look with the providers. We, we took a biased sample of physicians who had experience working with pharmacists in these expanded roles. Because only physicians who have that experience working with the pharmacists in those roles are going to be knowledgeable to provide that feedback. So, for example, if I ask someone who's never played baseball what it's like to play baseball and if they enjoy it, well, they're not going to have a good feel for it. We need to have someone that's been in the game. And so, we take the people that have actually worked in that model and ask them what they think. And what were the results? 96% reported overall benefit. I do not see a turf issue here. I see support. I see the clownfish and the sea anemone. And it was agree or strongly disagree in that study. So, on, and the values weren't traditional pharmacy items. Access to care, primary care, shift in workload, great numbers, great support. And the message is continuing to spread also. We're getting more recognition, expanding into the public sector, into the legislative sectors, and pharmacy models are shifting. How about CVS? What a great example to set. As we're stepping into the role of being healthcare providers and recognized as such, we're taking a role in patients' health. You wouldn't, for example, walk into your provider's office and expect to be able to buy a pack of cigarettes. So when we expect to provide the same level of primary care, we should probably expect to be a role model for that too. Impact that we're starting to see, and it's starting to come in flurries too. We're seeing state Medicaid changes coming across. Mission and vision statements with all of the, the state and national organizations. Two, three years ago, well, no, I shouldn't say that. There were missions that were promoting pharmacy, but they've all started to coalesce their message. They've changed it, and they tend to update it as things can progress and continue. Student pharmacists are changing the future. I had a student come to me today, or yesterday, and tell me that he wanted to be a provider. His first day with me, right out of the blocks from pharmacy school, and that's a change. And I don't doubt that these students that are coming out with these ideals are actually going to be the ones that are changing pharmacy long after we throw in the towel. Well, I shouldn't say throw in the towel. My apologies. Long after we retire and are done. That sounds better. So Washington State activity, I owe this information on this slide to Don Downing. He's actually kept me updated on things uh, for over the last year. I've received some emails back and forth from you, and I greatly appreciate it. So just, and this is probably preaching to the choir, but just in step, the Attorney General said, yes, we are providers, and insurance should pay for it. Then in February 2014, the OIC jumped in, and they said, yeah, you know what? You can't deny pharmacists enrollment in that. They are providers. Now, we actually changed up the paperwork a little bit, sent it back to those state insurance providers, and now in April of 2014, the OIC actually has a letter going out and saying, hey, you have to respond to why you're not allowing us to be providers. Outside of Washington, there's a flurry of state activity going on. Don't get me wrong. I think Washington State is one of the leaders in this process, absolutely. But I still think it's important to look outside our borders and look and see what else is going on. There are places working on pharmacist provider designation. Some places are still working to optimize the Pharmacy Act. Some 
creating payment mechanisms. And the thing is, is we started one step at a time and we got at it. And there are different levels, there are different approaches, but it's still chipping away and moving forward. We may be ahead of that already, but every bit of that in every state is still important. So the goals of all of this, we're trying to get national provider status. That's what we're working for. We need the states to come together. We need to get all of this to coalesce. And it's not always going to come smoothly for us. So change the nomenclature. Change the language. Say that we are providers. Say that we're here to take care of patients. And we just happen to be medication experts. Commit to assist other states. Washington State is a leader. Don Catterman was a leader. But leaders need help. They also are expected to, to lead and to help others go too. So look outside of your state borders and recognize that we have models we need to share and we need to receive other information from other states. Find where they've had their successes and some of their failures and make sure that we implement our processes appropriately. I mean, engage payers, and let the system sustain itself. Commit to partnerships with physicians, with groups, with state organizations. Jeff Roshan is here. Be involved. And then communicate that message and communicate it appropriately in the right language. Communicate it to your students, communicate it to physicians, providers, communicate it to other pharmacists. Sometimes it isn't always outside where the resistance is. Sometimes it's inside. And when we do come across a stumbling block, we need to be ready, be prepared, because not everything is going to go smoothly and may not all go according to plan. Be educated, ready, and able to drive on with the next step. This is the Washington State Pharmacy Association mission. Adopted in 2010 to continue through 2014. In the process of getting ready for my lectures and getting set up for all of this, I had received some slide sets from Rear Admiral Guyberson and it was a benefit because I've listened to him give his lectures probably a dozen times and I've listened to his message and I live it through my practice. But in really stepping into it and reading and listening and reading and listening over and over again, I really caught more of his message and I transformed more. And so I actually took the time, I went through the Washington State Pharmacy Association website. I looked at your mission and your values and your goals. And as for this mission statement, Jeff, mission accomplished. You've done it, it's there. And so now we're in 2014 and it's about time to develop a new mission. Things have changed in the practice of pharmacy. And so, again, in looking outside of our borders and into other states, we need to make sure that we're still driving. So I wanted to share this with you. This was a slide that was left over from one of Admir Admiral, Guy Admiral Guyberson's presentations. This is the mission statement of the Virginia Pharmacy Association. And I'm going to just read it verbatim that really hit me. The focus of advocacy shall be to maximize contributions of the profession to public health and patient care. They took it away from pharmacy. They took it away from a person, a group, a member. They put it into the whole ball of wax and to increase public awareness of the value of pharmacy services. Pharmacy services, everything that we can do. So, drive it. And I'd really be in trouble if I didn't finish up with Admiral Guyberson's favorite slide. Here it is. Getting back to the Alice in Wonderland scenario that I said. So you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in bed and believe whatever you want to believe. But you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and we can see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Thank you.